Good morning, church. I'm going to read f- from Matthew uh, chapter 21, verse 1 to 11 in the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, it's the triumphal entry. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her coat. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and they will send them at once. This took place so that it, what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt. Then they laid the clothes on them and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar saying, Who is this? The crowds crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. This Sunday is called Palm Sunday, and it is the start of Holy Week, leading us to the events that we refer to as Christians collectively called Easter. Okay? So we believe in the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and coming of Jesus. We are now headed into the death and resurrection part of Jesus' life. So this specific event, which Kari just read for us from Matthew 21, was the gateway, let's say, to the culminating events of Jesus' earthly life. If you read the book of Matthew, you can think of this as the start of the end of the beginning of the gospel story. Do you guys see what I did there? So the start of the end of the beginning of the whole gospel story. And this was a weighty moment. So just to get us into the mindset of a weighty moment in which everyone knows that something is going to change, let me show you a photo. This was the 11th of February, 1990. The release of our late former president Nelson Holihlahla Mandela, accompanied by his wife, Ma Ueni Madikizela Mandela, and then we also have our current president, the Honorable Matamela Cyril Ramaphosa, Ramaphosa, sorry, to the left. Just look at the picture. I was alive then, actually. <laughs> you might not believe it. I was five. And I remember the news on TV One. Do you guys remember TV One back in the day? We had a big tube TV. So you press the button, and then the TV went boom, boom. And then we switched to TV One, and this was the visuals we had on the news. Everyone knew that something was going to change. Everyone knew that this is a weighty moment in history because this moment was fought for, right, by specific people for a specific reason. It's exactly the same with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So keep this picture front of mind as we read this text. Because as we read this text, you should get the same feelings you got when I showed you this photo. Today's theme is all hail the king. Now I know we don't live in a monarchy, but you've seen enough movies to know that if someone says all hail the king, then you need to decide now, there and then, are you going to hail the king or are you not? Like you can't stand unbiased. If someone says King Charles III just entered the hall and they say, all hail the king, you have to decide. Are you going to get up or are you not? It's decision time. And this is exactly what happened when Jesus entered Jerusalem. It's decision time. You have to decide now what you think about him. 
Now, just before I pray for us, there's a lot going on in this portion of Scripture. Okay? And I know that all of us are in various seasons of life, and I know that all of us are in various seasons of following Jesus. I'm going to do my utmost this morning to explain this piece of Scripture as well as I possibly can. Because you might think at the first reading, mm, I don't quite know where he's going to head with this. I promise you it will land and will be applicable to all of us. So let's pray and then I'll show you where we're going. Lord Jesus, we behold you as king riding on a donkey. On your way to sacrifice yourself for our sins. With many people shouting your praise and many people scoffing at you. And Jesus, there's something about you being determined to go all the way to the cross that just stirs our hearts and that is such a compelling picture to us. So Lord Jesus, we want to say this morning, all hail the King. And because we hail you as King, we open up our lives to you now to speak to us. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that your spirit would move, that your words would be illuminated, and that we would not leave this place unchanged this morning. I pray that in your name. Amen. I used the metaphor of waypoints in my last sermon, so I decided that this morning I'm going to use it again. So, four waypoints, markers en route, places to stop to know that you are headed in the right direction. Four waypoints to understanding Palm Sunday. Here we go. The first one, you have to understand the context of Matthew 21, okay? because we are jumping into a book at uh, chapter 21. That's going to be a quick one in the sermon. Secondly, there are important things in this portion of Scripture to help us understand what it says and also to under help us understand what it means. We're going to spend the bulk of our time at the second waypoint today. Then the third one is, you need to understand what was the procession of the lambs and why it is important to know about that. And I promise you, your mind will be blown because the possibility is that you might not have heard of the procession of the lambs before. And then the fourth waypoint to understanding Palm Sunday is obviously some applications to our own lives as believers for this moment we find ourselves in. So let's tackle the first one really quickly. The context of Matthew 21. I'm going to show you two slides. The one slide is a summary of chapters 11 to 13 of Matthew taken from a map um, from the Bible project. Okay? Here's what you should know up until this point in the book of Matthew. Jesus has taught, Jesus has healed, Jesus has walked, and Jesus has lived on earth. And as he has lived on earth, people have responded to him. People has respond, have responded to him. And there's three responses recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Either positive, people saying, absolutely, this guy is definitely the Messiah. Some people respond neutral and just say, yeah, like, I see what he's all about, but, but is he the Messiah? Not sure. And then you've got people responding negative to Jesus' life, saying that he is definitely not the Messiah. And we have these three groups present through the whole book of Matthew. And these three groups of people responding to Jesus as he lives and teaches. And then you'll see general people respond positively. Someone as significant as John the Baptist even questioned if Jesus was the Messiah. And then the Pharisees are a group of people who are playing an instrumental role in the Gospel of Matthew opposing Jesus, right? The religious elite the Jewish council, and a section of Judaism that believed that the kingdom was going to come through adherence to the law. So if we get the law right, then the kingdom will come. And now Jesus comes and he lives in a way that they feel that he's breaking the law, so now they are opposing him. Okay. Second slide that I want to show you is really the theme for the part of Matthew that we read from today, and that is there's a clash of kingdoms taking place here. So you'll see Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. 
You'll see people welcoming him with palm branches. I'll say something about now about that now. Then you'll see in chapters three to uh, twenty-three to twenty-five, Jesus is giving a scathing critique of the Pharisees, saying to them, "You are hypocrites." You say one thing, but you do another. That cannot work. That doesn't help anyone to understand the God of the universe, because the God of the universe is one who says and does. Do you see what I did there, Shiami? I just worked with what you said during question of the day now. Now you see Jesus asserting his authority, saying, I am calling the shots here, not you. And then you see people being offended by him and then wanting to kill him. A clash of kingdoms and this is the start of this section in Matthew explaining this clash of kingdoms okay let's move on to the second point some important things that we need to understand to understand the meaning of this portion of scripture I'm going to walk through them slowly I'll tell you what verses we are in and then Leon if you can help me to just go to those verses when I do speak of them so there are two crowds of people in this narrative there's the people around Jesus and there's the people in Jerusalem. And in these two groups of people, you find positive, neutral, and negative people, both outside Jerusalem and inside the, the Jerusalem. This story is written from the perspective of the positive people, liking what they're seeing and believing that Jesus is the Messiah. So in verses 1 to 3, you'll see the word they, and this they are the people around Jesus, and they are the people who were pilgrims to the great Passover feast that will be happening in Jerusalem in just a few days' time. It was time for Passover in Jerusalem. Passover, may I remind you, is a yearly remembrance and a celebration of the Passover of the angel of death during the great exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. Okay? You can read the whole of Exodus 12 to understand the Passover wheel, where it comes from, and where its celebration originated. Newsflash, in this week, we are going to read about the Passover again as part of your scripture reading for Holy Week. Now, this obviously meant a huge influx of people into Jerusalem at Passover, right? Because there were loads of activities happening in and around the temple especially sacrificial activities, as well as teaching from the Hebrew Scriptures in many spaces at different times. Think of the word festival, fam. That's what it was in Jerusalem. You would have seen that the population at that time in Jerusalem would grow from 10,000 people, more or less, to 50,000 people okay, in that one week. Can you guys imagine if the population of Pretoria, which is roughly 2.8 million people, right, would quadruple in one week because of the influx of people, right? It would be really busy and really full, and we would have, have traffic like crazy. That's what it was like in Jerusalem. They would sacrifice an animal at the temple every morning and every evening to start all the religious activities of the day and also to conclude all the religious activities of the day. So that means two lambs per day only for the temple rites. Then every household would need their own lamb. So there would be approximately 1,000 to 2,000 lambs needed for the celebration of Passover every year. You guys know if you roll down the M3? And you see those massive farms with a lot of free-range animals? Sometimes you hit a farm and you go, my word, I see more cattle than I can count. Right? That would probably be 3,000 or 4,000 cattle standing there. Can you guys imagine what 1,000 or 2,000 lambs would look like? Right? All pushed into Jerusalem in one week so that there can be some sacrifices. Now, you would need to get to the Passover festival at least five days before. It's celebrated. Why? Because you will have to get your lamb on the 10th day of the month to be sacrificed or slaughtered on the 14th day of the month. Once again, I can't explain all of it now. I'll keep you here until lunch. But go and read Exodus 12 because this is an embodiment and a obedience to Exodus 12. Lots of pilgrims as well, right? People who live in the surrounding villages of Jerusalem. You'll see people who have been following Jesus and have seen what he's all about and people who have heard what he has taught. 
And then there are also this group of people for whom uh, the Pharisees would have raised their eyebrows because Jesus hung out with them. And they were people who believed in Jesus after he taught them, right? Because Jesus was postured towards the marginalized, the people who would not be seen, right? That makes him really, really different from modern day political leaders. So they reach, this is so difficult to say, because what is it now? Is it Bethphage? Is it Bethphage? Is it Bethphage? Who knows, right? But they reach this place just outside of Jerusalem, and this place is also close to Bethany. Okay, now, I'm going to show you some pictures. I know not all of us got a distinction for geography, but it's really important to see where all of this played down. So let me show you a whole lot of pictures. I'm going to look like a weatherman because I'm going to show you around. Okay, this is modern day Jerusalem. A picture taken by myself or my wife, I can't remember. We had the privilege of being in Israel together from the Mount of Olives. We are now facing west. Okay, so that's west. This over here is south. We are on the eastern side of Jerusalem, so east would be behind us, and then north would be running with this valley all the way out of Jerusalem. This is called the Dome of the Rock, okay? It is a mosque at the moment, and this is where the temple was built back in the day before it was destroyed, okay? So this is the eastern wall of Jerusalem. This is the Kidron Valley that leads to Gethsemane, Gap Shemanim, the Garden of Olives. And we are now standing on top of the Mountain of Olives. And then the city of David, historically, is to the south of Jerusalem. So the temple was built there, but David's palace was over here. And then this valley running down here is called the Kidron Valley. And that connects with the Hinnom Valley on the corner of Jerusalem. Okay, next slide, please. This is a photo taken of the Mount of Olives from the Temple Mount that I just showed you. Do you guys see what we did there? So we were facing west, and now we turn around, and now we're facing east. Okay, That's actually north, but anyhow, I don't want to confuse you guys now. (laughs) So this is the Mount of Olives. So we stood there, and we took the photo of modern-day Jerusalem all the way here. This is the Kidron Valley running up here, uh, all the way to Gethsemane. You'll see A modern-day church building built there to commemorate Jesus' journey to Gethsemane. And then from there to the high priest's house, which is right around here. Next slide, please. This is just a photo taken of the Kidron Valley. You guys will see that it's really small. Like if you think valley in South Africa, you think Golden Gate, you know. This is a really, really small valley. Like you can run down that hill if you want to. Okay. And then next slide, please. This is what Gethsemane looked like. Olive trees and a garden. The garden of olives. Gat Shemanim. Gethsemane. I don't know if it's underwhelming to you. It's phenomenal if you stand there and you go, my word, Jesus literally stood here and prayed. These trees are more than a thousand years old, which is great, right? I mean, think about it. An olive tree carrying olives for a thousand years. That's whack. I mean, I'm used to spinach, click, 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 and it's all done. Okay, anyhow, next slide, please. This uh, is another shot just of the Temple Mount. So I want you guys to uh, keep your eyes on this wall over here where the Dome of the Rock is. And then next slide, please. This is what the temple used to look like. Okay, so this is a reconstruction of the second temple built in Jerusalem. Can you guys see this is a scale model of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus' crucifixion, okay? It's actually quite small. Look, there's a street light at the back, there's a crane, there's some skyscrapers. I mean, you'll see our shadows in some of the other pictures that I'm gonna show you, okay? So this is the Kidron Valley, this is the city of David, this is the, uh, what the temple used to look like, this is the Holy of Holies, this is the inner court of the temple, this is Solomon's colonnade, and this is called Burg Antonius which is where the Roman governor sent his uh, uh, delegate to keep an eye on everything that happens in the temple. So that is where Pontius Pilate was. 
on the morning that they took Jesus to him to be trialed. Do you guys see that? So listen, you can uh, do, uh, 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 you can worship your God any way you want to, but just know we'll be keeping a close eye on you guys. We don't want you guys to undermine Roman rule. We don't want you guys to teach anything that might undermine our power and might. So now, if you exit the temple to the northern gate, the Damascus gate, you'll go through that little path over there. Are you guys with me? Have you ever seen this? It's really, really cool. Okay. Now, Jesus sends people to Bethany. Not Bethany Ramashia, Bethany, a little town, okay? <laughs> Called the House of Figs. And what we see here is we call it divine ordering, okay? Something is going to happen because it was planned like this by the Father. We see another example of divine ordering in Matthew 26. Now, everyone in Bethany knows that Jesus is Lord. So, there'll be no problem if they say, hey, listen, Jesus wants something. Can you guys remember why Bethany? Because Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in Bethany. Like, his biggest miracle was done in Bethany. No one in Bethany had a doubt about the identity of Jesus. So Jesus goes, go to Bethany and get what I'm telling you to get. Okay, let's look at verses 4 to 7. This entry of Jesus is staged to agree with Zechariah 9 verse 9, which is an Old Testament prophecy. Okay, now remember that Matthew is writing to a Jewish crowd. So they know this prophecy and he emphasizes that Jesus fulfilled it. Can you guys imagine something's happening in front of your eyes that was promised hundreds and hundreds of years ago? They are seeing this prophecy being fulfilled in real time. Now, these people have been following Jesus for a long time. They've seen his work and they've also heard all the claims that were made about him. And now it is confirmed. So the excitement amongst the people who we can call the positives must be really massive. Now let's look at the quote from Zechariah. Tell daughter Zion, your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey. Okay, so daughter Zion means Jerusalem. Okay, so tell the people of Jerusalem that your king is coming. But how does this king come? He comes meek. Do you guys see it? Gentle, says the, uh, the ESV says meek. The CSB says gentle. The NIV also says gentle. The Greek word, which is translated in all these different ways, is praus. Now, it's a difficult word to explain, so I'm going to put it on a slide for you, because this is really the massive big point of my sermon. So if you miss this, you're going to miss the whole thing. This is what meek means means. If I can just have the next slide up, please. Meek means mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit, or meekness. So Jesus comes in riding on a donkey, and look how he rides on the donkey. He does it meek towards God, and what does that mean? This is really important. It's that disposition of spirit in which we accept his dealings with us as good, and therefore without disputing or resisting. In the Old Testament, the meek are those who wholly rely on God rather than their own strength to defend them against injustice. What an absolute ripper of a word, and what an absolute ripper of a definition. Can you guys see that Jesus is going towards his crucifixion with people scoffing at him? And Jesus going, I am going to fully rely on God and trust him for this thing that I need to do. I'm not going to take any power into my own hands. I'm going to do this gentle and meek. He does not ride a white stallion as a conqueror, as was the custom, but he rides what we call a lowly beast of burden, a poor man's ride, a donkey. 
And I know if you have kids and I say donkey, you're going to think of Shrek and then you're going to think of Eddie Murphy. Don't go there. A donkey, guys. <laughs> that kind of donkey. That's what Jesus rides on. That wasn't the best donkey sound. I am working on it. Why is Jesus riding on a donkey? Because he's bringing peace, not war. Do you guys see that? Show me a political leader who doesn't incite war in what they say or do. That is how Jesus is different from political leaders. Because he brings peace. So nothing about him, nothing about his vibe, or his disposition, or his posture says, I'm coming to fight and kill. Jesus' whole posture is, I'm coming to bring peace. That's why it's good news that he came. That's why it was good news that he rode into Jerusalem and that the words of Zechariah was fulfilled in front of people's eyes. That's why it's good news to us to behold him riding into Jerusalem. Why? Because he is a peacemaker, the prince of peace. He makes peace between God and us. We were separated from him by our sin and he fixed it. And he creates peace between us. The death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ makes it possible for us to be at peace with one another. We don't need to hate one another. We don't need to hate one another's guts, cultures, language or customs. We can be at peace with one another. Why? Because this king that came in on a donkey came in to bring peace and not war. And this peace lasts forever. Let me show you. Zechariah. This is the prophecy that is fulfilled in front of their eyes. We already read verse 9. Look at verse 10. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The bow of war will be removed. And he will proclaim peace to who? To the nations. That means everyone. And look at this. His dominion. That means his power and his authority will extend from sea to sea. From the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. It's still like that today. So this king, the messianic son of David, enters the city on a donkey. It's been written about this king since 2 Samuel 7 verses 8 to 16. And this is it. Like this is the one. This is the one you guys have been waiting for. And because people were conditioned to think of might and power and strength, this feels so upside down to them. Fam, we're still conditioned to think about might and power and strength. And that's why when we say as Christians, just love your neighbor. Like, literally love your neighbor. Knock on your neighbor's door and love them. That will fix this country. Then people go, ooh, that sounds too simple. Because we're conditioned to think that someone at the top has to do something. Jesus' road was downward, not upward. And ours is the same. So the way we serve the king by doing the same thing as the king in meekness and in gentleness will change this world and it will bring peace and it will see the kingdom come where we live work and play let's look at verses 8 to 9 this large crowd in greek it says big 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 yeah? exceptionally large they carpet the path for jesus with their clothes and branches and this was common practice for people displaying recognition to a king now, I know that some of you have been looking for the word palm, but you can't see it. And you're wondering why we call this Palm Sunday. The John account of this story says that they cut palm branches. And that's where the name Palm Sunday comes from. Now you know. And I don't even know if you actually wondered about it, but now you know. So this is where the paradox of Jesus' kingship is displayed very well. Right? Why? Because he comes into the city humbling, humbly and on a donkey. But the crowds bring him into the city with a public demonstration befitting a king. Do you guys see that? So Jesus chooses the way 
a, a different way than, mod, uh, than kings in that day, but people welcome him with a demonstration befitting a king. These are people who've been with him since the beginning of the story, pilgrims, positive ones, and they now constitute Jesus' royal procession by repeating these praises. Look at them with me. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. I love singing Hosanna. Do you guys know what Hosanna means? Two words put together. It's called a conjunction. A base and a base. Conjunction. It's two Aramaic words. And it means, oh, save. That's what it means. Save us. Save us, son of David. Save us from the highest heaven. Oh, save. Oh, praise. That's what it means. And in the first century, it means God save, praise be. So it's words that were reserved to say to a king, right? Jubilation. And it was common for people to use that word when they cried out for what? Salvation. Blessed is he who comes uh, in the name of the Lord. That's taken from Psalm 118. That psalm claims that the Messiah will triumph and he will save. So now that they are seeing this king enter into Jerusalem, what are they expecting? They are expecting to experience salvation. Why? Because the one who has been promised is the one who brings salvation. And he's not just a regular feast goer, right? He's the one who enters the city as king. And then the second Hosanna, in the last part of verse 9, um, is a very well-known praise or glory to God in the highest. Can you guys see the massive excitement in the crowd? If you've ever been at a big concert, or if you were at the Bethel concert last week, people, when they see someone they're excited about, what do they do? They cheer, and they clap. And they whistle, and they ululate, and they welcome this person. That's exactly what's going on in Jerusalem. To such an extent, look at verses 10 to 11, that it says that Jerusalem was shaking. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in uproar. That Greek word means the whole city shook. It's the same word used in Matthew chapter 2, and in Matthew chapter 28, when what happens? Yeah, when Jesus dies, and when the veil is torn, what happens to the city? It shakes. It moves. It's the same word. So, so much excitement around this king on his donkey that Jerusalem is currently shaking. That's the impact of the arrival of Jesus. What? A guy on a donkey? Absolutely. The king has just arrived. Now, People uh, around him come from outside Jerusalem. Now there are people inside Jerusalem wondering what's going on. And what do they ask? They ask, who is this? So the insiders, people inside Jerusalem, they are currently wondering who entered the city so audaciously and receives and accepts the crowd's word that he's king. Like, who is this person? But this crowd inside is just not that into him as the crowd outside. So what do they answer? Do you guys see their answer? I don't know where the answer is now, but the answer is, well, he is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Not that excited about him yet, not ready to say as the foreigners that he's definitely the promised king. Maybe a little bit more conservative, maybe a little bit more diplomatic, but you'll see now why the crowd responds like that. Okay, that was the whole second point. Are you guys with me? Do you guys see that once we read it slowly and we looked at some details in the scriptures, how it all comes alive so that we can understand it? Okay, now the third one. Let me tell you about the procession of the lambs. It's a really, really, really important uh, historical event that helps us to understand why Palm Sunday or Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is so awesome. Okay, so let's just get a photo back of the Temple Mount, please. There we go. No. Uh, of the very last photo, please. The one at, at the temple reconstruction. Here you go. This is the Shisanyama. 
A lot of braai going on here, right? This is where the sacrifices were done. And this is where the sacrifices was done, the Holy of Holies. And that is where only, only the high priest will go once a year during the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. So you guys can imagine, people had to enter the Temple Mount from that side. There was gates down here at the south end as well, and gates up the north end. And then I said that road leads to the Damascus Gate. Okay? Just look at the scale. So the wall of Jerusalem actually isn't that far from uh, the Temple Mount. You would probably, I guess it would probably take you between 10 and 15 minutes to walk there. Okay. Now, the lambs referred to in the procession of the lambs were very special lambs. Why? Because they were used for a specific festival, in a specific way, in a specific place, at a very specific time. So for this reason, the priests serving at the temple in Jerusalem had an agreement with shepherds from Bethlehem, approximately 10 to 12 kilometers from Jerusalem, to supply them with enough lambs for Passover each year, right? Supply chain, guys. Eh? Supply and demand. Groot handel. What's groot handel in English again? Wholesale, right? Wholesale for Passover uh, each year. Now, on a specific day, now you have to follow with me while you have that picture in your head. On a specific day, all these lambs would be shepherded from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. They would be presented to the priests. And through the temple system, each family would get their lamb to be sacrificed in a few days' time. This was called the procession of the lambs. Let's get some lambs in here so that we can get some lambs to be sacrificed. Now, every year, four days before Passover... A vast entourage of priests would file out of Herod's temple. It's this temple, and they would file out towards the north. There they walked north as they connected to the main northwest gate of Jerusalem called the Damascus Street, going to the north gate known as the Damascus Gate. I've actually been there. I stood there going, my word, unbelievable to think that so many thousand years ago this played down right here. The priests then began to line the sides of Damascus Street two by two, maintaining positions on either side of the street as they rocked back and forth with palm fronds in their hands. Why? Because as the priests positioned themselves, the high priest then and his entourage would make their way north to the Damascus Gate. And then outside the city, they inspected the flocks of yearling lambs to find the most perfect lamb. Inside the city... The tens of thousands of pilgrims who flocked to the city had already arrived, each one bringing a palm branch they had collected en route to the holy city. So the whole city was lined with greenery as they placed these branches, these branches outside the residence that they were staying. And the eager priests awaited the return of the high priest. When Caiaphas, he was the high priest at that time, entered the Damascus gate, bringing the selected lamb by his side, the priests at the gate began shouting. And what did they shout? Hosanna to the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that is coming. Hosanna in the highest. Why? Because the high priest is bringing in what? The perfect lamb. What will happen to the perfect lamb? The perfect lamb will be slaughtered. That perfect lamb will then atone for the sins of the people. So everyone is excited because what are they going to see? They're going to see forgiveness of sins. They're going to see God's mediator at that stage, the high priest, atoning for their sins and paying for their sins. That's something to be excited about. So now you've got the high priest and his entourage outside the city. You've got priests lining the streets. And what do they do? They pull the trigger on all the celebrations. So the moment they start shouting, Hosanna in the highest, everyone else goes, up. Oh, they started, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the, uh, the son of David. Everyone starts shouting. Remember guys, there weren't big screens, right? So you had to depend on who's doing what on that side of the crowd to know what's going on. So the priests file out, they're ready to welcome the high priest with the perfect lamb, and what happens? In comes Jesus on a donkey. Do you guys see it? It is awesome. So, 
upon hearing the shout of the people in the city, those who had already purified themselves in the ritual baths in the southern part of the city, ran into the street, also bringing their fronds. And what did they do? They started shouting, Hosanna in the highest. Everything is set for the high priest and the lamb. And now in unison, the disciples begin to shout, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the flocks of pilgrims join in the chant as Jesus and the disciples went around the northern part of the Temple Mount towards the gate of Damascus. Now in the meantime, Caiaphas, the high priest, has now exited the northern Damascus gate and he was heading out of the fields to inspect the flocks of yearling lambs. And now the chant intensified. The priests at the gate heard the chant and they began to shout. And they shout the same, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And now this chant cascades like a domino down Damascus Street all the way to where? All the way to the temple. Because people are lining the streets. And suddenly... The priests at the gate realize that they have been fooled. Because this is not the return of the high priest. This is Jesus and his disciples who began to enter. The people began to flock out of their homes, grabbing their palm branches outside the doors, and the shouting swelled throughout the city. Anticipation was high. You can see a priest rocking back and forth with his palm branches, breaking the rhythm, leaning over, and then peering up the street, going... Where's the high priest? And where's the lamb? Like you guys started singing, and now I'm singing, but I don't see the, uh, the high priest or the lamb. I see the lamb on a donkey, right? Being ushered into Jerusalem as king. Where's Caiaphas, the high priest? He's chilling in the fields. Can you imagine as he was returning from the northern fields with the Passover lamb in hand and he entered the northern Damascus gate, the streets was empty. What a story. Can you imagine the high priest going, why is everyone not uh, caring what I'm doing at the moment? Like this is the system. This is the way it's supposed to be. I am very important and this lamb is very important according to our law. This is the moment. Where has everyone gone? Well, everyone has followed the who? The king on the donkey who was welcomed as king. When he hears that Jesus has entered the city as a royal aspirant to the throne of David, he's furious. Of course he is. Because what Jesus is doing is he's undermining his leadership. The table is set for a bust up. And none of these two crowds knew what was coming. But what was coming is a clash of kingdoms. How brilliant is this, guys? Did you guys know this? How unbelievably brilliant is the timing of Jesus? Because he's fulfilling the prophecy. He's replacing the lamb. He's replacing the whole sacrificial system. And now everyone is excited about it because he chose exactly the right moment to run onto the stage. And his disciples were like, let's do it, man. Let's do it. Get him on stage. Give him the mic. It would be the same as going to a Bethel gathering and then you run on stage going, grab the mic and then getting the people all excited about it. Right? Okay. Fourth point, last point. Stick with me. I'll be done now. Let's think of some applications of this portion of scripture for our lives. The gospel writer, Matthew, he takes great care in 20 chapters to present Jesus in his fullness to us. And now it's time for the reader to make a decision. That's why I chose the theme I did, and that is all hail the king. Jesus is the Messiah, according to the scriptures. But his goal was a more fundamental salvation and a kingdom that was universal. Right? One that transcended the limited horizons of the crowds. That's what we have in current day political leaders. It's all the limited horizons of the crowds and what the people want. Jesus is different because the kingdom he had in mind and the salvation he had in mind was literally universal and cosmic in scope. Everyone and everything. The people in the day of Jesus expected a national political freedom fighter, a liberating king that would overthrow the Romans and set them free, one who will establish Jerusalem and the Israel kingdom again. 
Their thoughts were dominated by power, by glory, the overthrow of someone else's kingdom, and the establishment of a national political kingdom. These thoughts are not uncommon, uncommon in our world, fam. Think about any country of people under oppressive rule or a dictatorship in the world, even currently. There's always this expectation that forces from the outside will come and they'll use violence and combat to overthrow the forces on the inside. Exactly the same way that the people in the time of Jesus thought that he will save Israel. But that is not how he rolls. Jesus didn't do it that way. Jesus did not establish his kingdom by fighting the world's way. But he established his kingdom by dying humbly as a servant. Glory and honor and triumph comes in a different way. And that is by the way of servanthood. And through servanthood and death, Jesus' kingdom is established and manifest. And that is a paradox in itself. It's something that seems like it's opposing to one another. But that is something that we are called to love. We have many kingdoms colliding at once in our world. We have many things, many people, many groups of people, and many forces that want to assert authority over your life, wanting you to follow it or them. And all of these things uh, uh, promise stuff to us. A better life, fulfillment, salvation, call it what you want. Yet, none of it can bring forth salvation. None of it can make us right with God. And none of it can give us life in abundance. And you and I have to choose where our allegiance lies. And we have to live accordingly. So, will we choose the way of peace? Will we choose the way of servanthood? The way of death? The way of taking up our cross? The way of following Jesus all the way, no matter what the cost is. Or will we not? Because He's the only one who will call us to that kind of life. A selfless, giving life. Because He gave Himself to us and He was selfless and He gave His life for us. Let me show you a universal sign. The peace sign. That's a little bit different than a fist now, isn't it? Or a spear. Or a gun. Or a cannon. It's still a universal sign. But it's a sign that says, I mean no harm. It's a sign that says, I come in peace. This is how we ought to roll. Because our king rolled like this. On a donkey. Into a city. So it's either symbols of power in this world, or, if I can just have the last slide up, please, it's the palm branch. I think that's the symbol that we need to live with. I think we should carpet Jesus' path in our lives with palm leaves. And we should confess His Lordship also in our lives. And His Lordship in our lives means walking in the way of the servant Messiah. You and I cannot read this portion of scripture. And not be compelled to follow him and to do the same. This was one man entering an important city on a donkey 2,000 years ago. And we still talk about it. And we still read about it. Every single year. The Sunday before Easter. Why? Because in his entrance, he made the statement of all statements. And now it's up to us and our calling as his followers to live in that same way and to respond in that same way. I want us to respond by singing Hosanna with San Marie. So San Marie, you can come and uh, make your way. Can I ask uh, just one last time, Leon? If you can just put up the slide of the definition of meekness for us, please. As San Marie is getting ready, I want us to just see Jesus' posture. And then I just want to ask you, 
Is this also your posture towards God? Do you accept God's dealings with you as good? And do you trust Him and rely on Him wholly to defend you against injustice of people? Or are you currently resisting God's dealings with you through disputing it or through resisting it? Because if you are, you are not meek. But if we do accept his dealings as good, then we are meek. And then we are in the same posture as our Messiah. Amen.